and he made the altar for burnt offerings of acacia wood. Five cubits was the length, and five cubits was the breadth, and three cubits was the height. He made the horns on the four corners of the altar, and they were overlaid with brass. And he made all the vessels of the altar, the pails to catch the blood, and the flesh scrapers, and the basins, and the flesh hooks, and the fire pan, and the shovels, all the vessels he made of brass. Imagine the type of work that must be done on such an altar, an altar seven and a half feet on a side, with great horns reaching up from the corners, the entire thing bathed in bull's blood, which was part of its consecration. Flesh hooks and scrapers are to be used on whatever poor animal is laid upon the brass grating. Its blood gathered up in pails and basins, and the dismembered beast would then be burned. Its fresh blood and charred meat releasing an aroma pleasing to Yahweh. What kind of living conditions must these people have endured to prompt them to imagine that this type of deity ruled the universe? I'm your host, Jason, and you're listening to Dragons in Genesis. As soon as the first set of commandments had been carved into stone, the Israelites down at the base of the mountain hear thunder and see lightning and smoke. Now you probably think that Moses then goes down to the people and finds a huge party and a golden calf. Not so. Chapter 21 begins with more rules. These are also from Yahweh, and as he states in Exodus 21.1, These are the ordinances which thou shalt set before them. Yahweh then goes on to instruct Moses on the law code of Israel, beginning with a hard prohibition on slavery. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant to say rules on how to buy slaves. Now, the Bible differentiates between Hebrew slaves and foreign slaves. Foreign slaves can be owned forever, have no rights, and can be beaten to death for no reason at all. Hebrew slaves, on the other hand, are more like indentured servants. They're to be set free in the seventh year, and any wives or children they had at the time of their purchase can leave with them. So again, we have a clear example of Yahweh playing favorites. He does not love all of his children equally. In fact, only the Israelites are said to be his children. The next ordinance outlines how to properly sell your daughter into slavery. It then goes on to talk about what to do with murderers. Of course, they're to be executed. And it talks about how you have to pay property damages if you get into a fist fight with another man and the two of you injure a pregnant woman who then has a miscarriage. It talks about who is to blame if an ox gores a man or a woman to death. And this is determined by whether or not the ox tried to gore anyone else in the past. If the owner had been warned about an unruly ox and did nothing to solve the problem, both him and the ox must die. It talks about who is at fault if someone digs a pit and someone else's animal falls in. On and on it goes for several chapters covering thievery, burning fields, fields eaten by escaped livestock, borrowed money, the safekeeping of someone else's livestock, the killing of all sorcerers, and so on. In Exodus 22:28, Yahweh commands that the first yields shall be sacrificed to him. This would be a portion of the first harvest or the first offspring. He then goes on to plainly state what all is to be sacrificed to him. The first yields of crops, cattle, flocks, and human children. So here in Exodus 22:28, we have a direct command from Yahweh for the Israelites to perform human sacrifice. The firstborn humans, oxen, and sheep are to be nursed seven days, and on the eighth day, they are to be sacrificed to Yahweh. Now, a bit earlier in 2215 is the only attempt to address rape. It states that if a man rapes a virgin who is not already promised to another man, he must pay her owner the bride price and keep her as his wife. Property restitution is made to her father, for his daughter now being damaged goods. 
This is the same punishment for when a man is accidentally responsible for killing another man's goat. He pays the price for the goat and gets to keep the meat. Women are property in ancient Israel, and the law code of Yahweh is structured around that idea. The law code from Yahweh runs from Exodus 21 to Exodus 23. Nowhere in those three chapters does Yahweh prohibit the slaughter of foreign children, the rape of women, the owning of human beings as slaves, or invading foreign lands. In fact, it addresses all all of these things and either makes exceptions for them or Yahweh himself will take an active part as we see in Exodus 23 20 through 33 in which Yahweh says he will send forth an angel which he calls my terror to go before the invasion force and bring ruin to the Hittites Amorites Perizzites and others the law code of Exodus is not a basis for morality, but a list of guidelines for how one group of Bronze Age Palestinians can behave in an orderly fashion toward others of their own tribe, with no respect for women, children, or members of the same ethnic group who happen to live on another hill. To put this into perspective, we can look at other people in the ancient world from this same time period. In Egypt to the southwest, Greece and Rome to the north, and India to the east, rape is already prohibited by law by the time the editors compiled the finalized version of the Torah. So the ethics of the Bible are not only bankrupt when compared to modern laws in the developed world, they were behind the times for 500 BCE. After the law code, Moses finalizes the covenant by reciting the rules and splashing animal blood on the Israelites. And that's the end of the covenant story. The problem is that there was more than one covenant story, so the compilers of Exodus had to either pick one or include both. And since there were different sects in Yahwism, and some liked one covenant while others liked the other, the editors chose to include both versions. So they had Moses return with one set, then go back up the mountain for another, which is said to be equal and identical, but is actually completely different, as we covered in the last episode. But before Moses can come back down from the mountain, we have to cover two more things. First, we have the command to build an ark, an altar, some tents, curtains, and an enclosure. All of this is meant to serve as a home for Yahweh so that he can live amongst his favorite people. In ancient times, gods were not omnipresent. They existed in particular locations or were attached to objects. The Greek gods lived on Olympus. The Mesopotamian gods lived in clay or stone idols inside of temples in the center of each city. And in Israel, Yahweh lived in a pair of stone tablets inside a wooden box kept in a temple. Beginning in Exodus 25 and concluding at the end of Exodus 31, Yahweh describes his preferred living accommodations and the means of worship in excruciatingly intricate detail. He starts by demanding gifts of gold, silver, copper, dyed yarns of blue, purple, and crimson, fine linen, goat hair, tanned ram skins, dugong skins, which we have no idea what that means, and in some translations they call it dolphin skins, acacia wood, oil for burning, oil for anointing, spices, aromatic incense, lapis lazuli, and a bunch of other fine stones. After that, Yahweh spends the next half dozen chapters spelling out exactly how each and every one of these items must be used. A box has to be built of a specific size, from a specific material, plated in another material, and have rings attached for carrying. Then the lid, and carrying poles, and so on. We learn about the exact construction of altars, tents, tent poles, curtain rods, a gigantic curtain enclosure that surrounds the whole thing, and even implements used to carve up sacrificial animals. Believe me when I tell you, 
that this is the second most mind-numbingly repetitive portion of the entire Bible. But there are a few important details that need to be mentioned here. The lid of the Ark of the Covenant is adorned with cherubim, which we're told now are simply angels with outstretched wings. We've all seen the depiction of the Ark of the Covenant in Raiders of the Lost Ark, but that's not what cherubim looked like. Cherubim were beastly creatures with four wings, the head of a human, bull, lion, or eagle. Though others weren't humanoid in appearance with animal heads, but animal-like with human heads. Those were typically the body of a lion, the wings of an eagle, and the head of a human. The Hebrew version of the Shidu of Assyria, or the Babylonian Lamas. If you subtract the wings from the cherubim, you'd get the Great Sphinx of Egypt. These were chimera creatures created with the strongest land animal, the lion, the strongest air animal, the eagle, and the animal with dominion over all, the human. So these are strange Assyrian and Babylonian creatures that are adorning the top of God's Ark, not angels like we see in every modern reproduction of this image, especially on ancient aliens. The modern Christian concept of the angel doesn't exist yet. We're then told that bowls, ladles, jars, and other utensils must be made to bring offerings to Yahweh. They're to all be made of pure gold, and on these the Israelites will bring food and drink and oil to Yahweh. This was common in the ancient world, dating as far back as the earliest permanent settlements. An idol would be set up in a special house, usually at the center of town, and the priests would be in charge of running that house. They demanded daily offerings for their deity, which was usually made of baked clay or carved stone. The offerings had to be of the finest food and drink, along with the occasional product offering like tools, baskets, etc. Basically, everything the priest wanted was an offering to the god. In this way, the priest could live comfortably without performing any real labor. The piece of stone would receive the offerings, and the priest would then use them. In exchange, the priest would bestow upon the population blessings from the magic rock that they all worshipped. We have the same setup here in the second half of Exodus. A temple tent must be erected to house their god, though it would also be large enough to accommodate the priests. Food and drink and riches must be brought in for their god, though if the priest didn't consume them, they would quickly fill the tent and rot. Call me a skeptic, but this kind of sounds like a con. The temple tent must be a long rectangle with an opening facing east toward the rising sun, and the ark where God lives will be in the back third, separated from the rest of the tent by a curtain. This is important. In Egyptian mystery religions, and later in mystery religions of Greece and elsewhere in the Mediterranean, we see temples arranged in exactly this fashion, especially where solar deities are revered. The temples are rectangular and arranged east to west, so the opening either faces the rising sun or the setting sun, usually the rising sun. This allows for solar rays to penetrate through the open door to the back of the temple where the tabernacle resides so that the sun god can enter on these beams of light. Now, a brief aside about mystery cults. The emphasis is on the mystery. Common worshippers do not know all the secrets of the religion. Only the highest ranking priests are privy to that information. Others ascend the ranks in stages, learning bits and pieces along the way, and are only taught when those above them recognize that their minds are, have been properly conditioned to accept the next wave of secrets. If a follower isn't ready, they don't advance. This way, you never reveal something too bizarre for the initiate to accept. Scientology is a perfect example of a modern mystery cult. The new recruits don't know anything about Thetans and Xenu or interstellar nuclear wars and demons sealed up in volcanoes. Those things aren't revealed 
until the student is ready to believe it. Until then, it's all kept secret. In ancient times, when their god lived in a physical place, the god was kept separate from the worshippers by a veil of some kind. In Egypt and Greece, they used a stone wall to divide the rear third of a temple from the masses. The secret rites that were performed remained secret. When the Israelites adopted the idea of Egyptian mystery religion, a practice likely brought over by the now unemployed Aten priests, they couldn't erect a stone wall because they were nomadic. So they divided up the priestly tent. The exact measurements given for the tent in Exodus are most likely exaggerated. Such a tent would be too large and unwieldy to be packed around on a day-to-day -day basis. The story is from a time during or even after the time of the temple, but before the Israelites lived in their cities, they certainly worshipped in tents. The actual temple tents were probably much smaller than what is described here, which is meant to represent the dimensions of the smaller temples scattered throughout the eastern Mediterranean. So by this point in the story, we have a Midianite god demanding to be worshipped in the manner of an Egyptian mystery deity similar to Aten, and the punishment for anyone peeking behind the curtain to discover that it's just a bunch of priests fleecing the populace is, of course, death. In fact, only Aaron is allowed back there, and he must wear special vestments described in Exodus 28 that are equipped with little bells so that his approach can be heard by Yahweh, because God isn't all-knowing yet. We read in Exodus 28.35 that if Aaron sneaks up on Yahweh by approaching the rear of the tent without his bells, Yahweh will murder the high priest where he stands. It kind of makes you wonder what Yahweh gets up to back there in the tent if he kills anyone who walks in on him. So now, Aaron and his priests must also be anointed. And since this is the Old Testament, anointment means bathed in blood. A bull and two rams must be butchered and their blood splashed on the newly minted priests, and this practice must be repeated for their descendants which are the only people ever in history allowed to lead a church service for Yahweh. So, if your priest isn't a direct descendant of Aaron and has never been bathed in ram and bull blood, he's not a legitimate priest. Finally, in Exodus 32, we get to the good part, the golden calf part. So Moses is delayed for so long on the mountain that the people at the bottom get antsy and really want a god to worship. They somehow are no longer noticing all the thunder and lightning and fire and smoke and earthquakes that we're told are going on while Mo is up at the top. And they ask Aaron for help to make a god. So while Yahweh is telling Moses that he wants Aaron to be his high priest, Aaron is down on the ground making an idol. Now here's where it gets interesting. All the Israelites bring up their gold to Aaron and he throws it in the fire to melt it. And in Exodus 32, 4, we read that he melted the gold and the spirit of Yahweh formed it into a calf. Wait, what? Now I was taught in Catholic catechism that Aaron molded it into a calf, but the text clearly states that Yahweh is the one who gave it shape. Now, your Bible might actually state that Aaron or some goldsmith is responsible for the form, but the farther we go back, the more of an active role Yahweh plays in the formation of the idol for which he will punish the Israelites. The oldest copies of Exodus that we have with this chapter intact, have Yahweh forming the calf out of gold for Aaron. At no point do the people decide what the form will be. They simply cast the gold into the fire, Yahweh shapes it into a calf, and they remove it. So Yahweh forms this idol in Exodus 32.4, and Aaron sets up a feast day for Yahweh 
in Exodus 32, 5, centered around the calf that Yahweh formed. They're not worshiping some strange god, as you've almost certainly heard in Bible study. It's a feast day for Yahweh, and the symbol for Yahweh is a golden calf that Yahweh himself has formed. This isn't paganism, but another form of Yahwism. Now, if you recall from earlier episodes, the god El, which was an entirely separate deity, was eventually merged with Yahweh. El was sometimes called Bull El, meaning he was as powerful as a bull. Some cherubim for El have bull heads, and even in Exodus 34, 29, when Moses returns to the people after collecting the second set of commandments, he is said to have horns protruding from his head that frighten Israelites, so he must cover his horns with a veil. El and Yahweh were associated with the bull, so it makes perfect sense that Yahweh would have formed the gold into the image of a calf. Another quick aside. Many words in ancient Hebrew have multiple meanings, so it can sometimes be difficult for modern scholars to determine which is appropriate when making a translation. The word used to describe Moses' face is karan. The word can mean to shine or horned. Many modern Bibles prefer the shining Moses over the horned one, but that wasn't always the case. Michelangelo's Moses is depicted with horns because, at the time, that was the common translation. But what about the pre-Christian sources? What did the Israelites believe? In the 3rd century BCE, a group of Jewish scribes set out to translate the Torah into Greek. When the Jewish scribes, who were quite fluent in both languages and certainly more familiar with their own scripture than people 2,300 years in the future would be, decided to translate the word, they wrote it as horned, not shining. It was suggested in the Hebrew and later formalized by Jewish scholars in the Greek. Moses was transformed by his meeting with Yahweh to have horns. Now, bull idols were common, but this story comes later, from a time when all graven images were taboo. The story is here to show people that, yes, once they made and worshipped images of Yahweh, but no more. That is no longer the practice. It is no longer acceptable to make images of Yahweh as a bull. Yahweh was once a god of all the people, but now he is a God of mystery. You do not get to see your God. He is to be hidden behind a curtain and only seen by the high priests. Only in that way can worshipers be fully dependent on the priestly class. This is why the golden calf of Yahweh had to be destroyed. It's a story not about people making idols, but about the temple priests destroying the old ways of worship and replacing it with a new form, much the way we read that they tore down the Asherah poles at the temple in Jerusalem and purged it of all other images there, including including the serpent and bull gods. It's about the transition from the open worship of the Canaanites to the mystery religion of Egypt. Now, Yahweh's reaction to this is horrifying. He sees Aaron and the others worshiping his golden image and decides then and there to kill the entire nation of Israel. That's it. My favorite children have gone too far. They have decided to worship an image of me instead of the mystery of me. Time to start all over again. But Moses steps in and changes his mind. He tells Yahweh that if he does that, then the whole world will mock Yahweh. They'll think that Yahweh only took them from Egypt so that he could kill them himself. Yahweh sees reason and comes up with a new plan. The golden calf will be ground up and fed to all the people. 
and a collection of soldiers have to go around and slaughter 3,000 men, women, and children from among the Israelites. This slaughter of their kin earns them a blessing from Yahweh. The original Ten Commandments are smashed, and Moses tells them he must stroll back up the mountain for a duplicate copy. Yahweh then sends some unknown plague among the Israelites as punishment, but we're not told the exact nature or how many die from it. We're also told in Exodus 33.20 that no man may see the face of Yahweh and live. Even though Moses has been seeing him for the last few chapters, we can also recall all the times in Genesis that he appeared bodily to the likes of Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, a pharaoh, king Abimelech, Isaac, and his wrestling match with Jacob. We also had the mention in Exodus 24, 9, where Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 elders all stare at Yahweh without a single one of them dying. Yahweh then gives Moses a new set of commandments, which I covered at the end of the last episode, and they do not even remotely resemble the first ten. In fact, there are only three that are similar. Here they are again, in case you forgot. Thou shalt not make treaties with those who inhabit the promised land. Thou shalt tear down altars, temples, sacred stones, and asherah poles. Thou shalt not make sacrifices to other gods. Thou shalt not make molten gods. Thou shalt celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days in the month of Aviv. Thou shalt sacrifice the firstborn offspring of every womb. Thou shalt honor the Sabbath. Thou shalt celebrate the Festival of Weeks and the Festival of Ingathering. Thou shalt not offer blood sacrifice with anything containing yeast, and let nothing from Passover remain until morning. Thou shalt not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. After this, all the boring details that were laid out in those earlier chapters concerning the method of construction for the ark, the tent, altar, curtains, and murder instruments are repeated word for word as they recount their construction. Remember when I told you that chapters 25 through 30 was the second most mind-numbingly boring portion of the entire Bible? Yeah, this is the first. It begins in chapter 6 and runs until the end of Exodus in chapter 40. And the whole portion could have been summed up with the statement, They did all that boring stuff from before exactly as commanded. But instead, they take four chapters so that they can cover it in painful detail. And with that, I am done with the Exodus story. The second book of the Bible is finished. And, oh, wait a second. I've been promising you that I would talk about Dionysus for about the past half dozen episodes. Now, I'm not going to do an in-depth episode on Dionysus here. I'll be saving that for later when I get to Jesus. Uh, spoiler alert, Jesus is based on Mediterranean myths, not a real person. But I will give a very brief overview of a couple of similarities between Dionysus and Moses that I feel sort of illustrate quite plainly that m the Moses figure might be based in part, on the Greek god. This small collection of similarities will just be listed out, but if you want to learn more about them, I strongly suggest you pick up a copy of my source for these. The book, Did Moses Exist? The Myth of the Israelite Lawgiver by Dio Murdoch. It's available on Kindle and paperback through Amazon, and again, I really strongly suggest that you read it. So, the following is a very brief list of the details about Dionysus that might have been used when creating the Moses figure. I'll just read them off real quick and let you decide if there's any similarity. 
So Dionysus was born in Egypt, safe from the waters in a small box, called Myces, the same MSS consonant spelling used for Moses. Dionysus had two mothers, was brought up near an Arabian mountain, exiled to Arabia. He battled Egypt, married one of seven sisters, became a father, connected with solar imagery through mystical fire, instructed in the secrets of the gods. He served as a prophet, marched into a land that flowed with milk, honey, and wine, carried a magic rod that changed into a serpent, carried a rod wrapped with snakes like the serpent pole Moses later carried, caused a plague. That plague ended with the creation of a new religious festival. Non-believers were cursed with sickness that damaged their private parts. See 1 Samuel 5, 9 and 6, 4 through 5. Led an army of both women and men. Inspired followers with a pillar. Led an army with a pillar of fire. Battled Pantheus, who was referred to as a serpent or a dragon, a term also used to describe Moses as Pharaoh. He fled to the sea to escape a tyrant, used a magic wand to part the waters in order to cross on dry land, drowned his enemies after his crossing, introduced sacred music, connected with the Myra or Maria. Female followers sang and danced after their enemies were defeated struck the ground with a magic wand to create a spring for the army, used a magic wand to slay a great enemy, was ordered to destroy an impious nation, was a great civilizing force who created government by a constitutional order, engraved laws on two stone tablets as a lawgiver, created a festival called Sabbat or Sabazia, had a godly image that was placed in an ark, the sight of the contents of this ark drove beholders insane, had two horns on his head, was associated with the bull, learned the rites of sacrifice and taught them to his people, gave detailed instructions on how to sacrifice various animals such as goats, sheep, oxen, and bulls, established a vintage feast following the autumnal equinox. Dionysus had a dog companion, while Moses had a companion named Caleb, which means dog. Dionysus' dog and Moses' Caleb led them to the promised land full of grapes. Major festivals held at the vernal equinox. Both were lawgivers who were associated with writing, books, and literacy. The burial site for both is said to have been hidden from the people to this day. Both said to ascend into heaven. Both are named Soter, or Savior and Deliverer. Both used treachery and deceit to subdue barbarous nations and sack their cities. He made treaties with those lands his followers passed. He commanded the sun to stand still. And he established a proselytizing faith. Okay, so I said there were a few, and that was a little bit closer to 50. So anyway, those are the details of the life of Dionysus, details which predate the writing of the Torah. That's it for this episode. As usual, like us on Facebook, where you can contact me with any questions or comments. And don't forget to leave a good review on iTunes. And as always, thank you for listening.